we have enough seats maybe before we start that everybody can come in and sit down. There's a whole row here. Yeah, so if you if you've got yeah. seats, so seats everybody has a place. That would be great. And if you wouldn't mind before we start the meeting, if you could shut the phones or your ringers off. So that would be great. Okay, so we'll start like always with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, Commissioner Jenks made the comment that you're all here to see me. But uh, um, I don't think that's really the case. We're here to see him. But uh, you're here to see him. Okay. Um, as you notice, uh, the mayor is not here. Uh, the mayor is out of town and uh, sends his regards of not being able to be at the meeting. As the mayor pro tem in rotation, um, I will sit in for them, uh, Ron uh, Gillum, tonight as uh, the mayor um, for tonight. So um, with that being said, um, can we have an approval of the agenda? Move the agenda as presented. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, that passes. <coughs> we have uh, the minutes from the special meeting. The special meeting. Uh, approve January those, please. 13th. January 13th. Move to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. It is approved. Okay, next we have uh, communications. Does anybody? I'll, I'll make a motion to approve the minutes from the regular meeting of January 13th. Second. Communications, does anybody have anything? I take a vote on the regular. Oh, we'll take a vote. I'm sorry. Thanks on the regular minutes. It's easier than it looks up there. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Thank you. That passes. Not communications. Anybody have anything that they want to add to the communications that we've received? We do have a, uh, a resignation from the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board that we have to accept. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that, do you want to put that up over? I'll make the motion. Okay. Um, un unfortunately, we disappointed her and she wasn't able to serve because of a time conflict. Um, we appreciate knowing that before it became an issue, so. Uh-huh. Second? <coughs> Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? <coughs> Thank you. Okay, do we have, is uh, Commissioner Zach here tonight? Elaine couldn't make it tonight. Elaine couldn't, thank you. So now we reach public participation and uh, for anything that isn't on the agenda, and if you want to contribute to, uh, please have name and address when you come to the microphone. Yeah, yeah, it's juicy. You can believe it, I got something other than an item on the agenda. Oh, that's uh, great. Serious? <laughs> Tony, where's your bow tie? Oh, I know. Uh, no, Steve Barron. I already gave him high for that. 26066 Henry. And um, it's an appropriate time, kind of almost coincidentally with me being here and all this uh, beautiful snow that fell uh, Sunday. Is um, And maybe this might be directed more to the management of the city than the commissioners. that. Uh, the issue of sidewalks not being uh, properly maintained. And I'm not saying by the city. I think that Claire does an unbelievable job given the resources that she has. And I am not pointing blame on the city. Uh, our residents, and there are some here that I see tonight, do not have their sidewalks uh, snow removed. And when you walk, it's one thing to walk through three or four inches of snow, but when you're walking through a foot or a foot and a half of snow, it's not fair to the residents, to, for the city, and I do think it's the city's fault for imposing this on us. 
Now, some streets have about 90 or 95 percent of the sidewalks cleared by the residents. And the city will probably eventually come down those streets with their plow or whatever they have, their brush, and maintain them, which will be a waste of city time and resources. Uh, but there are other homes, especially in the Hill District where I live, because I have found that the worst offenders of this are people that have commercial services because they don't want to pay, I'm assuming this, their commercial services extra money to maintain their walks. They just figure the city will do it. Well, the city no longer should be in the business of providing these. They shouldn't do it. They shouldn't affirmatively represent that they're going to do it to the residents. They should affirmatively represent that the city no longer has the resources to be able to do it on a timely basis because, as everybody knows, once you walk on snow for a week and if the city comes around, it's, again, almost a waste of their time. So I'm going to ask that the city management consider stopping snow removal services since most of the residents do it themselves. And uh, those residents that don't do it, it's far too late when the city does come around to take care of it. Um, so I would uh, I'd humbly ask that. Now one other issue that's related that I think the city needs to look into, it comes out of pure courtesy to your fellow residents. Those people who have commercial snow removal services for their driveways, uh, the commercial services gratuitously decide that they want to plow the snow from driveway A across the street onto the right of way of homeowner B. I believe that snow removed from a driveway should, may, should remain on that property owner's right of way. I don't think it's fair to put snow in front of somebody else's house where maybe they have guests that come over to like to get out of their cars or maybe they like to put their garbage cans on the grass rather than in the street or maybe they shovel their snow by hand and need a spot to lift the snow onto the front lawn where the city deposits you know, from the plows. I have a home out of town. The first thing that the snow removal man said to me in this other city in Michigan, where do you want your snow? Because the city will not allow me to take it anywhere than on your property. So you show me where you want it when I remove your snow. And that was, I said, fine, put it over here. But I think that the snow removal people are, I'm not going to say that they're too lazy, but I'm going to say that they don't have the courtesy, the city doesn't have an ordinance, and the homeowners have not made a request. Now, the people that live across the street from me, I asked that neighbor if he would have a snow removal person not put it on my front lawn. It's not my front lawn, the city right away. And they've agreed to, and they've done it very nicely, and I thank them, and I appreciate it very much, because I do my snow myself, and I have to have some place to put my snow, which goes on my right away. So I think that the city needs, if they don't have yet, an enforceable ordinance to require snow that's removed from driveways to remain on that property owner's right of way. <coughs> so those two issues, sidewalk and snow from driveways. Thank you, Mr. Fairman. Sir? Yep. <clears throat> You're totally right. My name is Fred Mann. I'm at 10454 Kingston, and I'd like to supplement Mr. Bourbon's observations about <clears throat> sidewalk maintenance, is that in that there are people who habitually park their cars over the sidewalk. Uh, it happens more frequently at corner houses with, that were constructed with not drivers that are not long enough to park the car outside of the garage. And frankly, that was a choice that was made when the garage was built. Uh, but, but appropriating sidewalks for car parking is something else that ought to be addressed. It and, is addressed. Uh, there is a city ordinance that prohibits parking on, across, or over a sidewalk. Yes, and it's more honor than the breach of the observance. Well, if I leave my car on the street at, after 3 a.m., a member of the constant. Const but your, const your question about is whether it's been addressed, and the answer is it was, it was on, it's been on the books for a long time, and it was amended uh, maybe two years ago to deal precisely with the issue that you were that you're discussing. Okay. And you know, one of the problems is, as uh, you know, 
police drive around the city if they see it. Uh, you know, it's more than an inconvenience in the, in the case of a person with a disability, uh, in the case of an uh, a a, uh, older <coughs> individual. You know, there's safety risks involved in having to go down in the street on, on the ice and everything, you know, to, to get around somebody's car. But you know, this also falls under the category of uh, being a good neighbor and realizing that. I, I get it, but I mean, the city does have. We, ad we address that specifically to make the ordinance hopefully bulletproof, but it still has to be enforced, which means people should call public safety, which is something people don't like to do. They don't like calling the police on their neighbor, and I understand that. But you know, if the police don't see it, there's nothing they can do about it. They don't it. see it. They're like this. Well, because I see it every day when I drive in on, off of Wyoming, on to, uh, 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 off of Can you ever call public safety about it? Uh, Policemen have eyes. I didn't ask they, you. They, they, I asked you if you ever called public safety. No, but I'll do that if you think I should. I absolutely. Okay. They're not gonna. They don't ask your name. They thank you they for do. calling. Well, I think you'll find the city manager will probably tell you as a policy is to thank you for calling, and they'll take care. They can tell who's calling. I assure you, they know who's calling. <laughs> but the point is, what's important is that, and whether they what they do or don't do, if they just tell the resident, look, please don't do this. It's it causing a problem with your neighbor. End of story. But you're right. That but if people should you know, you say they should, but sometimes they need a little help. Sometimes they need an ophthalmologist, namely you, by calling. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, sir. Aaron Reddish, uh, 25447 Wareham. Uh, just as just a reminder, an invitation to the commissioners and to our neighbors that uh, next Thursday, February 12th, uh, there'll be a town hall meeting with the uh, zoo uh, to talk about uh, 2015 events and uh, noise concerns. It's going to be um, in the one of the places in the zoo. Uh, do it'll you know? It'll be in the, the e newsletter that goes out okay. this Friday. It'll be great, great. So uh, I invite everyone and all to come. And if you can't come, uh, please contact me. I'd be happy to pass along um, concerns or issues uh, to the zoo. Thank you. Thanks. There's some folks sitting out, standing out in the hall. There's plenty of chairs in here. If you'd like, see, this we're inviting you in. And you know. <laughs> Come on up. <coughs> yeah, we're live. Thank you. Uh, why are we on the subject of the zoo? Name, address. Kenzino, Huntington Road, Ms. White. Address, please. 8634, Thank Huntington. Thank you. While we're on the subject of the zoo, as of close of business tonight, um, the zoo has not confirmed that there will be any public comment period, and they have thus far refused to allow us to do a PowerPoint presentation. I find this extremely disturbing. Oh, Jules, nice to see you. I'm yeah. sorry you missed the meeting last month. Well, I was in trial in Saginaw. Well, that, that happens. But after you did that Chamber of Commerce speech for the zoo in December, I thought you might want to be here for the zoo presentation. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Mr. Zeno. Anybody else would like to address anything that is not on the agenda? <coughs> Great, public's participation is closed. And first thing on our thing under presentation is an update from the Teen Council. And we have Rebecca uh, Enerson. Enerson, thank you, Rebecca. Um, so I'm Rebecca, I'm from the Huntington Woods Teen Council and I'm a secretary. So this is the first meeting we've been at this year and that was kind of an oops, um, but Tracy gave me some points to just tell everybody about. Sure. Um, we're still selling the Huntington Woods magnets for the oh. cars. They're five dollars at the rec center. Um, we're almost out though, so they may not be around for much longer. Um, this coming March, we are having five of our members go to the youth symposium. It's being held at Central Michigan University, and theme this year, it changes every year, is Be Your Own Superhero. And it'll be focusing on what you're doing after high school and making deci decisions to benefit your future. So it'll be like a small like Friday, Saturday, Sunday thing. 
and um, we just finished our bottle drive where half of our proceeds will go to any of the teen councils that need to send a member that is unable to pay the um, price to go because our teen council is very good about making it affordable to go but some teen councils because they can't raise enough money the fee is larger so um, we raised it so that one member could go for free and then our other half is going to is being split up among the teen councils um, then we are working with our um, member from previous years Maddie uh, Sabbath and we're collecting items for a no-kill animal shelter um, our meeting is Thursday and we are collecting paper towels blankets cat and dog toys Clorox wipes leashes pet store gift cards animal shampoo and dog and cat treats and we'll be collecting them through the month of February okay. and you can turn those in at the rec center um, this coming May, we are sponsoring the Michigan Victory Games. We are supporting this because it's an athletic games where people with phys physical disabilities compete in Olympic-like activities. They'll be held at Michigan State University, and our donation will help with lodging and supplies. Um, the Huntington Woods Men's Club has asked us for their help to work at their auction again this year for the checkout computer data system. Um, we are always happy and excited to work at this event um, because they're so willing to support us in many different ways. And then our recent events that we've had is we've had our Santa breakfast slash picture event and then we last in the last couple of weeks, we had our daddy-daughter dance, which was the biggest one we've ever had yet, with the largest attendance. And then every Friday, we have our pillow polo and floor hockey, which is kindergarten through third grade. And that's it. Rebecca, can I ask you, someone was asking me the ages to where one can come, you know, how is it if you want to become involved in the, in the teak council? We start at sixth grade, and it goes through twelfth grade. So, um, t the earliest board position we have is 8th grade for our middle school liaison. Mm -hmm. But many of our members that are on the board right now, we've been through it since 6th grade. Mm -hmm. So, so do they just call the rec center? No, or is they it just show up. Show up to a meeting, and the meetings are on? 1st and 3rd Thursdays. 1st and 3rd Thursday. Then. At 7. At 7 p.m. And then... Every once in a while, we'll have a, we call them breakout mm -hmm. sessions afterwards. Mm -hmm. And at, from like 8 to 8.45 after our meeting, um, we'll all get together and we'll usually have more snacks and we'll okay. talk about um, our upcoming events and we'll um, brainstorm. So our last one was about some fundraising ideas and we came up with like bottle drives and just a bunch of different stuff. And then we've also talked about our um, different events that we want to do, and they coordinate that with Leah, who's our event planner. Wonderful. Anything else any of the commissioners have to add? Thank you so much for coming tonight. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. First thing on the item of business is historic district uh, committee study matter of consideration of historic district commission's request to set up a study committee to review two possible new historic districts. Um. Okay, thank you. Uh, the uh, historic district commission received a letter from a resident uh, asking the historic district commission to consider setting up additional historic districts in order to preserve uh, houses. This was primarily kicked off by the house that came down on Pembroke. Uh, so the first step in that process is the Historic District Commission sends a letter to the City Commission, asks you to formally consider that. If you are interested in, uh, in uh, researching it further, you would have to set up a study committee. They would look at the homes, decide, uh, which ones were historic, which ones were not, uh, do a very thorough evaluation. It's a volunteer 
uh, study committee present and report back to you for your consideration. Um, so we did a little bit of cursory work ahead of time. There were two areas identified uh, by staff that, uh, based on the historical layout of the community, we thought might have a concentration of historical resources. Um, then also as part of that uh, review, Hank did a very cursory windshield drive-by of the homes based on his knowledge of architectural standards to see which ones could be or could not be considered um, historical resources. And we put together a percentage by block so that you could look at each block block by block. So while you have your color-coded maps, we also have, um, we could also put it up here so that as we're talking about the different blocks, the public can see what it is. And, and we also have copies if people in the back of the room want to see hard copies <coughs> rather than rely on this. So the, the matter that is before you tonight is to decide whether or not to establish study committees to take a look at, uh, which is the first step to determining whether or not there are enough resources to establish a historic district. Can you repeat that one more time? Because I think Tony was passing out math. Sure. Thanks. The only matter that is before you tonight <laughs> is to consider whether or not to establish a study committee that would do research on the homes within this, this potential area and a report would go back to the commission for you to decide whether or not these areas warrant being designated as historic districts in order to maintain the, the character of the community. Can I clarify, at that time, we would have a public participation yes. with the with the empiric evidence that the study committee has gathered about the region in order to make an educated decision. Yes. The, okay, the, and have public participation at that time. Yes. The, the, the process is set up. I want to make it clear. The process is set up by state law would be, if you're so inclined, to, you would set up a study committee if you thought that these areas warranted further study. You would appoint a volunteer study committee that would do uh, research. The volunteers <coughs> would do the research on the areas. They would present a, uh, prepare a draft report. There would be a public hearing. And a final report would go back to the city commission. Thank you, Amy. So I think that the easiest thing to do is, you can you turn the lights on? And um, it has uh, some of the oldest homes in the community uh, because this is where we started. Everybody's got it. 
Are there any empty seats next to you that you have a coat or something on? Oh, there's one empty seat right up here for someone in the hallway. One, one over here. There's actually two seats. Four seats. So come on in out of the hallway if you would like. Here we go. There's another seat up in front. Mr. Lord, there's two seats for you and your son. Come on in. Take a load off. There's two seats right here, Tom. Uh, there we go. Okay, good. That makes everybody comfy. All right, Amy, if you could continue, thank you. Sure. Um, this is identified as Area 1, 11 miles top, runs down to Boardman, Wyoming, to uh, Scotia. And this particular area was identified because they have uh, some of the oldest homes are in this area. So taking a look at this uh, cursory review, the pink homes, uh, this is not going to be accurate. This is just going to be a very cursory glance. The pink homes would be the ones that we believe might not be historic. The ones in blue would be the homes that might be historic. Again, there, there's no accuracy, but we wanted to kind of get a, a feel for whether or not, you know, how, what the percentage was of historic versus non historic resources. So this is area one, and we have labeled each block to make them easier to have a discussion about. So it runs at A, B, C, D, etc. And with your agenda item, there is a corresponding list of percentage of resources. So for instance, block A, uh, you take the, the three resources there, that's about a 9% concentration of probable historic homes. Not accurate, but, but probable. Uh, so your highest concentrations of homes are in block G and block, uh, block G and block J. Um, so, and then we did the same thing with the other district, which is the remainder of the hill. We know for a fact that there are historic homes there. Um, there, there had been some research done in the past, back in 2004, uh, but it was never acted on. But it might be easier to take area one by itself, and then move to area two, and maybe take a look at them block by block and decide whether or not you're interested in setting up a study committee or you want more input into the process or and move forward in, in that kind of an orderly fashion. Okay, why don't we look at um, uh, if the commissioner has any um, input, please let me know. But we can look at the first area, the number one area, A through L in the Bronx area. Um, any discussion through the commissioners first, please? I'd like your input. I think there's many of these lots in this area, or lots, but many, many of these zones in the area that don't even come close to meeting the percentage requirements. So that as we go forward as a commission, both in, in this area and area two, and discussing whether or not we even want to form a study committee to, mm -hmm. to go further, I think we can help the process by eliminating some of these areas that don't even appear to have a chance or not the back. Um, and I don't know if we can do smaller areas, selected properties like the original uh, Baker house that's on LaSalle there, that's across from the LaSalle fountain. Um, and that the first, rough. you know, that, that area right there I think also has the first home that was built right. in Huntington Woods. So uh, there's uh, potentials there, but to, I, I don't know the answer to this question. Does a historic district need to be landlocked? Or can we have little areas here and little areas there? That would be something that would be interesting to hear the study committee report on if we did form one. <clears throat> but there's not a lot of concentration here, so it's pretty hard to, to justify anything in this area. Yeah. Hey, we could define any, any area, right? You don't have to have like a whole block. You could actually go in between a block. You can go in between properties. You can go into that. It's always best if it's contiguous. If it's not contiguous, basically what you have is the potential for more than one district. 
Um, realistically, you know these are set up in blocks. That's not how it would have to end up. For example, if you took part of block F and you took part of block G, and then you took part of block C and part of block B, like half, half, and half all the way down, you'll find that you have a higher you know, percentage of contributing resources. So the reality of this is, is how you define the areas will directly affect the proportion amount of percent of contributing natural resources. So that's one thing that a study committee would look at if and when they do, you know, if and when it's a pleasure the commission to appoint that. Personally, I think it would be useful for whether it's administration or, or us as a commission to narrow down the areas. Um, and when we get to that point, even have a public hearing at that point before we even start a committee, get some input from the public, and then decide where we should go from there. The only thing is that what we might do is hash back and forth non-credible, you know, um, uh, uh, empiric evidence of what is. Even we have, just for example, um, the Baker House has a state historic designation. So I think it's covered. You know, do we? I'm going to clarify. So in doing research about historic district, guess what? That house is not covered. That house could be torn down at any time. That was the first women's hospital that was a maternity ward. That is a very important piece of property that sits in the, that is in the city of Huntington Woods with a great historic uh, value behind it. So those are the things that I think it's important that we do the study committee that you know we're doing the study committee, and if you want to be part of the volunteers that do it, please, we will pick the volunteers. We, we do need some people with experience, but I think that we need to be able to make a decision and bring a good presentation forward. If we're going to do this, we need to have all of our facts. And that's where I, the, actually the state, the historic, that is usually the process that you would follow. Am I correct? Mm -hmm. That's state so, law. The state law. So. I think that, you know, and without, and I, believe me, I am an avid reader of Next Door Neighbor. I don't hold it to any impaired value, but I do get the pulse of the community and, and what you are thinking. So I do value everybody's input. I wish everybody was a little bit nicer on there and because <laughs> life is short, but I think that part of what I do, and as a researcher, research, for the evidence, give you the evidence. The only way we can do that is if we get someone to study. So you get the facts. We won't do anything until you're there and we make a decision together. So I think that we have to, you know, that's what I would like to see go forward tonight in both of those um, areas. They both have value and they both have homes. Um, and. That's what I wanted to bring up. But other commissioners, do you have input? You want to make any? Hear what people have to say. Okay, so no more commissioner uh, comments. I'd love to hear from the public. If you could um, come up to the microphone, name, address, and if we can limit it to um, so everybody can get a chance to communicate to three minutes, um, I would appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, I'm Richard DeMann, and I own the uh, Baker Farmhouse. Um, <clears throat> I just want to say that uh, unless we have some protection for that house, uh, when my wife and I sell it, it's going to come down. There's no question about it. Um, it's, not a huge it's on three lots. It's probably worth 750 grand just for the lots. So you know, I'm, I was on the original uh, historic district study committee. I serve on the historic district council. Um, and I think it's a good thing to do. Uh, it also, having a historic district also increases the property values. Um, and, you know, it can be proven that the houses in Huntington Woods that were not in the Hill District uh, during the latest crash uh, lost more value than what the district did. So I would ask the commission to please uh, study, uh, authorize the study committee. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Namana. Next, anybody? Just raise your hand and I'll direct you. 
forward. Thank you. Please yeah. come to the mic. I'm going to in one sec. Thank you very much. My name is Stephen M. Taylor. I live at 26094 Henry Boulevard Welcome. in Huntington Woods. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm the one that posted on uh, next door, as I'm sure all of you know. Um, let me tell you what my experience has been up to this point. Uh, on January 7th, there was a meeting before the Historic District Committee, um, and I decided to go because uh, there was something essentially with regard to increasing the historic districts within Huntington Woods. So I went. I was the only one there from the public. Uh, Amy Sullivan was there, and of course the six members or seven members of the committee were there. And what struck me, and I was listening uh, during this time to what they were saying, and what I did is I heard certain things said, and I didn't hear other things said. And what ended up being said during that time was that, and I'm quoting, um, this is a good time politically to do this kind of thing. Um, and that was said on more than one occasion. Now, uh, the original uh, uh, PowerPoint presentation uh, cut off one of the districts um, at Lincoln, northern border being Lincoln. Uh, one of the people there then said, let's not forget North Pembroke, implying and speaking specifically about the uh, uh, Michael Morse house. Uh, which is, of course, in North Pembroke. And all of a sudden, instead of Lincoln being um, the uh, northern border, we have 11 Mile Road being the uh, northern border. Now, the point that I'm making is the decision to even send a letter to you it was purely political. There wasn't a single fact, not one, that was mentioned to justify this, uh, this uh, effort to increase or add certain historic districts. And when I mean by that is that there's got to be, it seems to me, some factual basis. Mm -hmm. If you want to increase uh, uh, the historic districts within Huntington Woods, there's got to be <coughs> some rationale, some factual basis to do so. A historic district is an aberration. That's not something that Huntington Woods ever had until about 10 years ago. And Huntington Woods did pretty well for the last 80 or 90 years, as a matter of fact. So the historic district that came in here 10 years ago was an aberration. If you're going to increase that area, that geographic area, it seems to me this, there should be some factual basis to justify it. Now, let me t tell you what I mean by factual basis. Point number one, um, was there or has there been any increase um, in um, the uh, price of homes? The economic question uh, that are in that is, uh, the homes that are in the historic district um, as compared to other homes in Huntington Woods that are not. I would suggest to you there isn't a scintilla of evidence to that effect, not a smidgen of evidence one way or the other on that particular issue. Next question, what do the people in, this, in the historic district say about being in the historic district? What kind of experiences have they had with regard to the historic district? And finally, number three, what about the people who are outside of the historic district, what do they feel about being in the historic district, even though at this particular time there isn't. And as I said, there isn't any evidence one way or the other with regard to any economic benefits, in other words, the price is going up. Now I will say, though there may not be any studies from, or economic... From your research, from your, from your opinion and what you've researched. Well, is there any evidence? I don't know of any, and I've talked to real estate brokers, and if you can give me some economic evidence, I would love to see it. That's what I'd like to see the study committee give. Oh, oh, I, oh let, me, let me just stop you for a second. Okay. What you're suggesting is that the study committee is going to do what needs to be done before you have a study committee. This is circular argument, and I've heard that before by other people. They basically say, well, gee whiz, let's have a study committee to determine certain facts, and by the way, the study committee that you're talking about setting up doesn't deal with the issue that you just mentioned. The study committee simply looks at the historical basis for the homes in the areas chosen. So it has nothing to do with the economic aspects of whether homes go up or down in the historic district. Let me simply then beg to disagree with you on that particular point. Let me also point out that those there are no studies, there is anecdotal evidence with regard to historic districts versus uh, areas that are not historic districts. I'm the evidence. I live 
just south of the his present historic district on Henry Boulevard. Now, two things have happened in the last 10 or 15 years. I'll cover one very quickly. Uh, Steve Behrman built a house 10 or 15 years ago, which if Hendry was in the historic district, in other words, my block, that house would never have been allowed to be built. Second, and maybe more relevant, and obviously more relevant, there's another house that was built in Huntington Woods in that, on that particular block. I'm sure you have seen it. Now, there was, I think it was Lee... Um, well, you know you're well over your three minutes, so you need to wrap I, it up. I, I know Thank that, you. and I'm speaking as fast as I can. The house, house burned down. down. Mr. Weisenfeld's house burned down. Well, that may be the case. But as I look at it, I'm saying to myself, if I were in the historic district, and, and you, I, that house would have stayed, other than the fact that it was burned down, would have stayed as it. In other words, status quo would have remained. And that status quo was a nondescript home. Instead, that house is, is, that was down. A new house was built. That house is owned by the Zimmermans. I'm sure you've seen it. That's a beautiful home. It's a modern home. It would never have been allowed to be built in a historic district. So now I live across the street. So let me tell you as I view that particular house. What I see there is a house that's a gorgeous home that has added value to my house, as a matter of fact. So I'm trading something that would have been the status quo, a nondescript home, for a new home, a beautiful home, that's added value to my house. Which choice do you think I'm going to How make? How do you know that? What's the, you what's, know the, that. F, what's the data? What's the look, that's not look, look what, I said it was wait, anecdotal. What, what, I didn't whoa, say that. Wait, wait a minute, Mary, just a minute. Oh, I know what's I the know. data to support your claim that the Zimmerman house, and it is beautiful, it's down the street for me, but well, what's the data to support your claim that that's added value to your home? Well, there's no way for me to give you anything of that nature, obviously. I'm telling you what my perception is. And by the way, my perception would be like anyone else's, including any home buyer who would come in to take a look at the block on my house. Everyone would say the same thing. And I might point out, and I don't think there's any question that Lee Weisenthal's house isn't anywhere the same kind of home. What I'm basically suggesting to you is that there is a benefit to the, the, the aspect of change. What's called, you know, dynam dynamism. That's what we have in this particular community as we have in this country. Called change. Now, I understand I don't have too much more time. So let me cover, <laughs> I'm going to be as quick as I can. Let me cover a couple other points that are going to be very quick. There were a lot of um, comments made over next door, and I'm sure you're familiar. You know and what? I really don't want to address next door neighbor comments here at the meeting. I would like, if, you know, let the next door neighbor comments stay at next door neighbor. That's and fine. That's not what I'm getting at. Okay. If you'll let me finish. I'm just saying, two of the comments that were made basically bring the distinction quite clear, or make the distinction quite clear. Bob Welpman, a well-known real estate broker, basically said Huntington Woods is a community where uh, we trust the people to make the right decision. That is to say, we have 95% of the homes in Huntington Woods to be private homes. The private homeowner is, is Bob basically suggested and stated, we trust you know, the homeowner to make the right decision. On the other hand, it's very interesting. We've got a comment from Robert Lebo, who made, it was very honest and very forthright about this matter. He basically said the difference is that on the one hand, you trust the homeowner to make the right decision, but if you're in a historic district, you require the homeowner to make the right decision. Let me simply suggest to you, we don't need to have someone, or, or homeowners, be required to do anything. We'll make the right decision without the state or the government telling us what to do. So I'm going to ask you to deny outright the request at this particular time. Thank you very much for your time. Anybody else would like to participate? Name and address, please. Ari Smargon, 10444 Lincoln. Um, I'm, I've only been here like 17, 18 years. But I'm kind of confused as to what signifies a historic home or a historic district in Huntington Woods. Um, I've 
familiar with other historic districts like Society Hill in Philadelphia or other places. Um, and my second question is, based on the current provisions, if a house on, let's say, block one is designated historic, how would that affect the other homes on that particular that same block? Since we're talking about not all homes on the same, on the block might be considered historic, I'm I'm kind of confused <coughs> as to really. I think a lot of people are confused, and I think we have some historic district uh, representatives here. Would anybody like to answer that question? Or right. Hank, would you like to answer that question? Whatever the pleasure of the commission. Please I'm do. Happy to do that. Um, as to the first, as to the question as to what happens if one resource is designated on a block, the second, uh, in, what you, happens you to the stand, stand up and up face and the people? Thank you. Sure. Why don't you come to the mic? That that way we can get all that answer on, in case someone wants to view this later. Sure. Thank you, Hank. Uh, basically, what he was asking about is uh, he doesn't understand what creates historic districts in the neighborhood and in Huntington Woods. He understands what the qualifications are in other places. The qualifications are basically the same. The Secretary of the Interior puts out guidelines which is used to establish what is and isn't a historic home. It's not so important that George Washington slept here, but if he did, it certainly helps. Um, basically, what we're looking for is homes or history that might be relevant to Huntington Woods, the development of our community. <coughs> And that's when you're looking for history, that's what you have. When we delved into the rack and the golf course, there was an awful lot that we found out that had national significance. We weren't aware of all the national significance until the study committee went in and started finding all this information out. So that's where the study committee came into play in Rackham, as far as that becoming a historic district. With homes, you look for architecture, design. Who was the architect? Who lived there? What part did they play in the development of Huntington Woods? So those are the types of things that a study committee would be looking at. Uh, as far as what happens if you have a block that has one resource and then for a while doesn't have any other resources, the other non-contributing resources would be looked at specifically as how they impact the house or the resource that's there. So if you have a house that's a great historic resource designed by a famous architect and has value as a historic resource, the house next door to it might be looked at is what impact it has towards that house. So if they wanted to put on like a substantial addition that would block the views and vistas from that particular house, it may be looked at by the Historic District Commission in that aspect. But that's really the difference. Otherwise, if viewed as non-contributing resources, there's <coughs> houses in the Historic District right now that are non-contributing, that have had new porches, that have had new windows. In fact, there's houses that were contributing resources that have had new windows. So, um, having said that, that's really, hopefully, that answers this question. Thank you, Hank. Um, you want to come up? Yeah. Allison Iverson, um, it's been a long time, 26063 Dundee. Um, I guess I just want to start with a flashback to the tree ordinance. And what we started out with, with that was a survey that was circulated and, uh, and then we went into a study. <coughs> and an awful lot of people spent an awful lot of time researching and studying for the tree ordinance. And what ended up happening is we all found out after the fact that we didn't like it. We didn't want it. It didn't fit for our neighborhood. And we fought it. Here we are again. This time, we're taking this into consideration that a lot of time is going to be spent, a lot of research is going to be spent. People are going to be giving up things in order to find out whether or not we should have a historic district. We're not even asking the homeowners if they want this. And I think that's where we need to start. You need to ask the people and, and listen to them when they tell you no. And, and for some reason, if it all comes back, everybody says, yes, I want you to research my home, then so be it. But we, got, we have to take a step back, or we're going to end up exactly where we were. And I promise you, I have no problem putting a sign out standing on the corner again for petitions to undo it. That's great. The only thing that I want to clarify with you is that we did have public participation with the tree ordinance in which we didn't have people come. So that came to, by the time it came to the commission, it was already coming to us from a vote after having. So what is different about this process, if it's voted on, I have no idea. The commissioners can comment on what they want. They could, we can 
before we get a study <coughs> to do it as uh, Commissioner uh, Paul suggested, or we can get the facts of exactly answer to the questions, have your input, have your questions with the study committee, and find out exactly. So we make a decision whether to go forward on the evidence, and that's all I'm saying. Not here or work. We did not do that process. It was very, very different from the tree process. If, if I let, if I just want to make sure that you understand that. Yeah, I, I guess the bottom line really is just, do the people in this neighborhood want that? But they need to know what what is it that they want. They need to know all the facts associated with mm -hmm. what they want because there's confusion. To be honest, I'm confused on some areas of it. I'll be honest with you, it's not my expertise area of research. And I think that even um, everybody that spoke has some questions. So if we could get these questions and get them answered and get the fact, I think we can make a really good decision. I know, but you're also you're talking about time and effort, a lot of time, a lot of effort to find these answers. And you're not even asking the most basic question, do the homeowners want to even subject themselves to this sort of inquiry. But let me ask you a question. Sure. Yes. How do you respond to the people who were very upset about the teardown in Pembroke? Not just the teardown in Pembroke, but other teardowns, because I've been approached by many people who say, why can't you stop teardowns? I say, you know, if somebody buys a house, they own the house. Absolutely. They want to, well, except that, you know, the whole issue of this history, have you looked at the state statute? It's 45 years old, okay? and it's very specific in terms of uh, what it requires and why. And it's all intended, first of all, to promote property values in the community, uh, to uh, accede to the wealth of the people to do that. I mean, it's all about positive. It's not about throwing a layer of regulation onto people without a benefit. That's not what, if you've read the statute, and I know you and I presume you have, do you know how many cities in Michigan have historic districts? Uh, I think I've been educated on 75 or more. Right. And there are some of the most, you can argue with some of the most beautiful cities in the state have, have taken this step under the statute. It's, it's a, <clears throat> the state statute enables local units of government to do it. And when this came into effect 10 years ago, uh, if I recall, one of the, uh, one of the reasons for it was uh, there was a developer, see, I saw your post, and you talk about trust us, trust us, trust us. Well, you know, there are developers out there. They don't, they're not us, okay? They're entrepreneurial, which is fine. They want to build houses, and they want to make money. Great. That's not necessarily you, okay? And so, if I recall the scenario, it's very, correct me, uh, the home on Borgman, the large white house on Borgman, uh, caught the eye of a developer who decided he wanted to build, tear that down and build three cookie cutter houses on that. And there were people that were really upset about that. They didn't like that idea. So <clears throat> my question to you is, if how do you balance the concerns of those who like with, with the house on Pembroke? When that house is gone, that house is gone. And it's something, you know, whether you liked it or didn't like it, or I liked it or didn't like it, once that's gone, it's gone. And what may be coming may be more beautiful, may be less beautiful. Some people are going to like it. Some people, I want to know how you think you balance those two things. I'm sure it's not an easy thing to balance. But I have to say that it, if I'm looking at the larger scale picture here, we're talking about this being an epidemic. There were 10 homes that, or no, 15 homes that were uh, not knocked down in the last 10 years. Okay, that's hardly an epidemic. And that was from the master plan. So I think that we need to just gauge that. Okay, that was a one situation. It's a very rare situation. We don't have to make rules based upon knee-jerk reactions to one situation. And in other areas, as far as like whether other, you know, 75 other communities are doing historic districts, just because Johnny's mom lets him stay up late does not mean that I'm going to let my kids stay up late. So we don't need to do things because everybody else is doing them. That's one of our benefits here in this neighborhood is that we are unique. We're going to lose that. We're going to keep giving up, giving up our freedoms, and then we're going to be just like everybody else. Thank you. Probably have a 
everybody here knows that I'm Mark Fink. I live at 26767 York within the Hill Historic District. I have also been a member of the Historic District Commission. I have personally felt no effect whatsoever for being in the Hill Historic District. I have not heard from a majority of the people in the district whether and how they've been affected. I've heard from a couple of people who have come before the commission who feel that they have been adversely affected. I haven't heard any details, but what it boils down to is that they were denied approval for something that they wanted to do. What I'm basically hearing from the opposition to the proposal before the commission tonight is the city shouldn't be telling people what they can do with their own property. It's a matter of individual rights. Well, yeah. But sometimes the rights of the larger community take precedence over the rights of an individual. The fact that there are over 70 historic district ordinances, or 70 cities in the state of Michigan alone, that have historic district ordinances, and literally thousands of local historic districts across the country, is pretty convincing evidence that there is value to historic preservation. So what I'm really hearing here is I don't want anybody telling me what I can do, even if what I want to do is bad for the community. Well. Is it bad for the community? How do we know without doing a study to find out if there's value in creating a historic district? Now, to address what Bob Paul said about perhaps limiting the study, I think that's not a good idea because how do we know if, if, if parts that have been proposed are or are not of historical value? Now, you take uh, area, in area one, the area one <coughs> 11 mile road, specifically those, that half of those blocks, from my own personal observations in the 40 years that I've lived here, I can't imagine that there's a single house in that, along 11 mile that has historical value. But I could be wrong. And this map done as a cursory review, says these are the houses we think might have historical value, and these are the houses that we think probably don't have historic value. How do we know, until we've done a study, which ones really do and which ones really don't have historic value? Once we determine that, then the commission can take a look at the final report of the study committee and say, okay, if we're going to form a, a, a uh, historic district, we will not include the, the houses of 11 Mile because there's nothing historic there. We will not include this block or this half of this block because there's nothing historic there or not enough worth preserving. Let's learn the facts before we make any decisions. Thank you, Mr. Fink. <coughs> I'm addressing you. Yeah. If you could please, while the person is discussing whether you agree or not, if you cannot have sidebar comments because it's really distracting to the person who's speaking and to us. Thank you. Is that low enough for you, Mr. Kay? Ms. Ms. Kay. Of course. I'm Linda Kays. I love these. And I live at 26338 Humber. And I, I have a statement that I'd like to read, but sure. before I do, I, based on something that you said, and with all due respect, we're doing something that is a logical problem by saying that how do we know whether the historic district is a good idea until we spend time and money researching it? Those but areas that we chose. I, I understand. This is a general statement. Mm -hmm. But we might be better off if all the doors were red. And we wouldn't know unless we researched it. Mm -hmm. We might, there, there are a lot of things that we don't know unless 
we appoint a committee and do the research, but it doesn't mean that apropos of not very much, we're going to spend the time and money to research it. But let me just go back to what I said. I, I said my name, and I live on Humber. I'm here tonight on behalf of myself and my brother Dennis and his wife Linda, who live on Salem and are out of the country. And all of the other residents of the woods who question the desirability of putting more houses into an historic district, many of whom also would like to see the historic district that is in existence go away. They aren't eager to talk about it publicly, especially if they are in the historic district, because they are afraid that there might be repercussions, and that's a problem. Most importantly, however, we, the three of us, question the process whereby this issue is coming before the Commission. We acknowledge that we've been told that a vote by you to establish a committee to study the question of making further historic districts and, if yes, which houses to include is only a preliminary vote and does not guarantee the result. But the reality is far different. Any recommendation by such a committee will be after substantial time and perhaps money have been invested in the study. And the members of the committee will be invested in the recommendation. When the recommendation comes before this commission, the train will have not only left the station, but will have accelerated to high speed and be unstoppable without great anguish to all concerned. This commission should not put the residents in such a position. Rather, this commission should refer the matter back to the Historic District Commission with instructions to explore the question <coughs> further with full public notice and ability to participate. If this happens, any recommendation of the HDC will, we hope, have been carefully considered with the interests of all current and future residents of the woods in mind. Thank you, Mrs. Case. Um, I want to give um, Mr. Sloan. My name is David Sloan. I live at 8050 Lincoln Drive, Huntington Woods. I first moved to Huntington Woods in 1959, 56 years ago. And I am a witness to its evolution. We enjoy the feel of older homes or we wouldn't buy them here. But over the last 30 years, I've seen wonderful evolution in the look of some of these homes. Some have expanded, some have updated, a few taken down, and, the, and some rebuilt. I see no widespread epidemic, as Jonathan Disbro has indicated in his letter to you. 15 houses torn down in 10 years. That is hardly an epidemic. As we continue to draw new residents young families with children, and that's the basis of our city, who will attend our wonderful schools and camps, we must evolve to meet their needs. We can't be stuck in the 1950s forever. Times are changing, building materials improve. We must look forward and we must change with the times. We have to embrace the future and we need to say no to the study because the rights of the majority should take precedence. In the last week and a half, I've talked to 60 people, none of which, none of them knew anything about what's going on. And when I explained them and showed them the materials published by the uh, committee and forwarded to the commission, not one person was in favor of it. The people do not want this. We take care of our homes. We are not children. We do not need to be told to take care of our homes and to be put in a historical district so that we have to have this application for 25 different items if we want to do something to the outside of our house, whether it be from painting or 
doing steps and go to a committee? Does our, do, do the neighborhoods look bad? I think they look rather good. So this is not needed. We are not, we do not need to be told how to take care of our homes by placing them in a historic district. So I'm going to ask you to embrace the future, say no to the study, go forward and not go backwards. Thank you. Does anybody over here, anybody else want to speak? Uh, Martha Schrode. I live at 10024 Elgin. Um, I'm going to stand up here tonight to address the study itself because I was on the original study committee years ago and I sort of fell into it because I've lived here my whole life and I've seen some changes too and um, I, I want to really talk more about the benefits of having the study um, because I didn't know what I was in for when I did the study, when I was involved, we started with nine citizens and um, we actually lost two. The original study was done with a moratorium on, I think it was the whole city. Nobody was allowed to do anything for a while. While we were busy running around, looking at houses, um, spending hours uh, combing through blueprints, um, I have to tell you that what we discovered about Huntington Woods, about my lovely fair city, is amazing. And I hate to hear people talk about how it's all about money, because it isn't. It's not all about money. And, and if that's what you think this is about, I think you need to take a step back and look at our history. Areas that we did not deem historic, but could have, did you know that uh, in the Ayers house, um, there was a little seamstress that used to take care of Henry Ford's wife's clothing? I know this because my aunt used to play with her granddaughter. And they lived over on the corner of LaSalle and Meadowcrest. And Henry Ford used to come and drop his wife off, and he would hand out things like watches to the children in the neighborhood. That's pretty amazing. These are things we never would have discovered about our neighborhoods, about our home, if we hadn't done the study. So for those of you who are all worried about having your rights taken away, how about just stepping back and giving us an opportunity to discover more about our history, about all the wonderful people that have come and gone in Huntington Woods, about the architectural treasures that we have here, about, um, about the zoo, for instance. You know, the zoo is a very important resource, and it could be taken away from us, too. I was also on the study committee for Rackham. Everybody was real glad that we didn't end up with 400 cookie-cutter homes with people having to go through a lottery system to figure out whose kids would get to go to Burton Elementary and whose would end up being shipped in other elementary schools in Oak Park and Berkeley. So before you just completely throw it out the window, Take a step back and look at the benefits of doing the study and learning about our community, learning about our homes, learning about the people who've lived here. And yes, it's nice to be able to have a variety of homes in Huntington Woods with different price points so that those young couples can move in, afford to live here, and as we all know, people move throughout the woods. But if you say no, right off the bat, you're missing out on a great opportunity and I would be the first one to sign up for the next study committee. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Richard McMullen, 26645 York. Um, and a couple of, I, I applaud the lady and the work that they did to keep um, all of those homes from being built at Reckham. Um, I imagine that the city would have supported, did support that 100%. I doubt that that's the same for the, the topic that we're discussing right now. I really endorse uh, everything that Mr. Sloan, I think his name was, said. Um, I have a couple of questions. The first one is somewhat embarrassing. Uh, I don't remember, and it could be my memory, 
but I don't remember being consulted um, when the area that I live in became an historic district. I remember people walking around with clipboards and looking at my house. Um, I also don't know, and I'm not sure that anyone does, uh, what, what fraction of the, of the homeowners in Huntington Woods actually want to have this happen. I don't know what fraction of the population is the impetus behind this, uh, this effort that we're, that we're doing. Um, I don't know that there is, is the uh, possibility of a referendum or something to ask everybody what they want. I, I can't remember, Mrs. White, the, the statement you made earlier was something along the lines of they need to know what they, they need to know what they want, so, so something along those lines. <coughs> We and need to know what what is the, we have a lot of questions about a historic district. Mm -hmm. So in order to make a very good decision on whether to go forward, right. I sort of need that study okay. to my, make that decision. My point is how many people in Huntington Woods um, are, are the impetus for that, how many people, I, I think what people want is to really be left to their own devices, which hasn't proved to be a, a great problem in all of the years that these people who've been here a lot longer than I have. Um, uh, I, I'm in an historic district. Uh, I, I don't know if I can get out of it unless I, you know, move. Um, and I, I don't think I was sufficiently consulted. And again, I would ask if anyone on the council knows what fraction of the population has a genuine interest in having this happen. Because um, I didn't, but I don't remember being asked. Well, I think that's the object here. The object here is, like I said, there, there, are, there are competing interests, if you will. There are competing values and competing points of view. And, you know, uh, you said, well, I wasn't consulted. Everything that was done, I live in the historic district. I knew I was, I was on either planning or ZBA at that time. Mm -hmm. And, and frankly, historic district, Jules. Huh? You are not in historic. Oh, well, yes, I am, Mr. Chairman. I sure am. Oh, so I can tell you, we've been turned down. My wife <laughs> wanted to put glass block windows in the side of our garage a few years back, and the answer oh, was no. Okay. The answer was no because it goes okay. to the yes, exterior. So, so since since I'm still standing oh, here, let me state. Okay. Well, before you, when you say you want people to have my feeling is the more information people have, the more people can make a reasoned decision about whether it is good or isn't good. In other words, instead of having it be purely anecdotal, uh, saying, well, I think that house adds value to my property, I assure you that when uh, other homes have been built, people call and they complain, how can the city allow that home to be built? It's a monstrosity. How dare you allow, you know, like, so all I'm saying is, the whole thrust of this is, is there data to support value? Is there data to suggest it has no value? Um, if 75 other cities have it, who are cities that we would consider to be, you know, mm -hmm. valuable in, in the real estate and so forth, is, are they all crazy? I mean, are, are, I don't know, but I'm just saying, if you're, all we're talking about here is a study and Linda's comment that the train is rolling down the tracks here, not, not hardly, not hardly. I not, mean, not yet. No, not, not, yet. not at all. Okay, not well, well to, my, my question, my probably, possibly my most important question is, um, who, what fraction of the population is driving this, is interested in this, and why don't we ask everybody if they want it or if they don't want it? That's my question. I, I don't know what the protocol is. Am I allowed to speak twice? Well, I really want to. If you can just sit down, Mr. Fink, and I would want to make sure that everybody gets a chance to who if would like... If it's not cumulative. Right, right. Okay. If it's not... If, and if we've already said the same thing, can you spare us the same thing unless you have something additional? I, I mean, I value every one of everything that you, everything that your opinions and what how you feel and everything. So this gentleman in the back has been very patient. Can you come on up here and introduce yourself and your? I am Kevin Lewis. I live in Huntington Woods, and I would prefer not to give my address because I might come under the disparity of the housing authority. 
But I trust me if you can that I live in Huntington Woods. You can give it to Joy quietly after. Thank, Thank you. You, you don't uh, have to put it on my <laughs> Your house wouldn't even be here from what I heard tonight. Um, thank you. Uh, I was at a city activity recently, and I felt that the past evaluations of this association or commission were okay for the city to do what they so desired. But I met one of the women that was from the committee who had left it because she thought they were overzealous and wanted to get away from the committee. And that really got me going as to somebody's concerns over the many of us, as we've heard tonight, compared to the few. And as we hear that 75 cities in the state of Michigan have a historic commission, that means that that's 4% of the state, cities, municipalities, uh, et cetera, which means that 4% of our population feel that it's a valid topic to have an historical commission. So I would say that, are they all right? Are they all wrong? Uh, they are just the minimal and very minuscule. So I would go back around to say to the people, what do the people want? They want to decide their own criteria of where they live, what their home looks like, and what they do with their funding, whether they're selling it, tearing it down, changing the gutters, changing the windows, whatever they might do is our most valuable possession we've got beyond our family and children. And there should be no commission evaluation. There should be no further harassment of the people that own homes here because a few of the people, theoretically 4%, care about what's going on with other people's money or other people's home. And my house, I believe, will be strictly torn down and redone when I sell because it's a 90-year-old piece of trash that I maintain and hold up with glue and mortar. And when I'm done, the house will be done. You want to put it into a historic district and tell the people that want to buy it, they have to sustain it with more glue, fine, but it's not appropriate and we need to modernize. Thank you. Um, I want sure. Uh, Judy Berry, 10735 Kingston. Um, we've heard a lot of adverse comments and I just wanted to affirm that I am in favor of a study. Um, I think you cannot make decisions without adequate research and going forward. I think we also under need to understand too as a community that we don't live in vacuums, that what we do on our property does impact everyone around us. Um, but I would favor going forward with a study. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Um, I'm going to let this gentleman right here speak. Um, my name is Hans Massacoy. I live at 26054 York. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Hans Massacoy, and I'm Thank at 26054 York. Thank you. I really just have this question. I guess initially, I'm, I'm probably against the idea, but I do believe we should have information. But I'm wondering, what is the cost? Has that been assessed? What's the cost That's of this? That's a good question. How much time have, cost is involved? We, that's it. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to talk. Yeah, I just, how much time and cost is involved in this study? Okay, that's a great question because we have done it previously on one district. And we do have Hank, which will he will oversee, but actually all the work, all the going down to the basement with the blueprints, <coughs> pulling up, and, and if I could just say a lot of those blueprints and a lot of the study, we lost a lot of things in the uh, flood. So if we didn't have done that historic district, we have a lot of valuable information on all the houses that were studied in the historic district that we that we may not have. So that was just one of the, I just want to let you know that they went down, pulled the things, and just one thing I found out, which I had no idea, my husband and I purchased our house for $104,000. We were never going to stay in there. It was 1,800 square feet. Everybody told us it's too close to 11 mile road, it's this. But our house became our home, and then we did. We became in the historic district, and we found when the historic district uh, looked that we have a Sears and Roebuck home, and we have a colonial Sears and Roebuck home, one of only 3,000 Sears and Roebuck colonial homes. Now, you may think Sears and Roebuck is a cheap you know, discount store, but it's very big deal to be in a Sears and Roebuck home. I didn't know, but I have a metal plaque, I can get a discount. There's all sorts of things that I found by being a member 
by them doing the study for me on a, to be in the Sears and Roebuck Club, and they actually had to come in and go into my attic and find it. I'm just giving you one experience of, of why I thought the historic district. I, so, I believe the question was, what's the cost? Uh, the research. But tonight, guess what? I'm the, I'm fit sitting in for the mayor, and I will thank you for that. So I'm finishing up what I'm saying, and I think the cost was zero. I think there is. No, I remember looking at the budget. There was no cost incurred in the study of the volunteers of the historic district. Um, I, is that the answer? Is am I correct <coughs> in that? Yeah, the only costs that were associated with the original studies for both the um, Rackham was a little bit different right. because there was a legal battle involved in that. But for the Hill District, the only costs that were involved were uh, copying, printing, research, articles, you know, that type of thing. So the cost for research and the evaluation that was really very minuscule. Okay. So more. there you go. That's a that's an accurate answer. Um, anybody who hasn't spoken, this gentleman right here. I'm Jeff Samaray, <clears throat> 10425 Welcome. LaSalle, and I'm a member of the HDC. I'd just like to make a couple brief points so I don't repeat what's already been stated. One thing I think is really important to keep in mind is the uh, latest draft version of the city's master plan calls for the protection of historic resources, and I know you're all very familiar with that language, but for the benefit of the room, I'd just like to read two sentences from the master plan. It's on page 18 uh, under the housing heading. Huntington Woods will continue to be the city of homes. Streets lined with overarching trees and beautiful houses will remain the city's single most defining characteristic. Quality, uniqueness, variety, <clears throat> charm, historic character, and pride of ownership will con continue to characterize the housing stock of Huntington Woods. Homes will be well maintained. New homes and additions to existing homes will exhibit a high quality of design materials historic resources will be safeguarded. Historic resources will be safeguarded. Now, that didn't happen on Pembroke. As Mr. Elfman pointed out before, once the house is gone, it's gone forever. You can't replicate it. It just can't be done. Uh, the second point I'd like to make, uh, this issue isn't about uh, seizing individual property rights, as someone alluded to earlier. This is about safeguarding our historic resources which is in complete alignment with the city's master plan. So it's not so much about what percentage of the population wants it, what percentage doesn't, it's in the master plan. It's the, the blueprint for leading the city forward. Historic districts are part of that. So I humbly request that you approve this study committee. Thank you. Okay. okay. I'm not going to let anybody talk before, so if there's anybody New, Mr. Zeno, we've already heard from you. And I was not talking on the historic district. I was talking under the open session. I wish to talk, talk on the historic district. Okay, I'm going to let this gentleman right here in the red shirt please come up to the microphone, please. And then I think I, mean, I think we've exhausted everybody here, so we're going to wrap that up. I can't think of a better way of ending this. Yeah. <laughs> Mary, I wanted to speak about the historic district. I should not be denied my ability to. Neither should Mr. Zeno. Uh -huh. You know what? There's a gentleman speaking right That's now. That's okay, but you said this is going to end it. I, I said we started it off at some point. We're going to wrap it up. Drew yeah. did not. When people have an opportunity to speak, how would you okay. like well, to have a sack stuffed you know, in your mouth? I don't think you like it. Um, you know something? Let's let's keep everything friendly. I had all oh. the intentions of letting the last couple people speak. I wasn't. I said let's start wrapping it up. That's what I meant. So continue. I'm sorry. Good evening. I'm Gordy Oliva, 26038 Pembroke. Mr. Oliva, I never met you before, but I've nice, seen you sign. Nice to see you. <laughs> Thank you. And that may be a good thing. We'll see. Um, I'm here tonight to uh, ask more questions and present options that, may, that I haven't heard considered yet tonight. And I'm not sure if commissioners have considered this. Um, I'm not taking sides. I am not advocating for or against the historic district. I will stay absolutely neutral. I'm embedded in this community. I've lived here for 13 years. I am 
professionally involved. I'm a, you know, have built and touched a lot of houses here. And I have to say that one of the houses that I touched 10 years ago was Marty Mulnair's house. And in fact, Commissioner Paul here has also was involved. We redid a kitchen and a few other rooms in that house. Um, I designed it. I was a general contractor on that job. We came in front of, uh, you know, we, we, we did a lot of work on that house. And to this day, that house is on my website. And that kitchen is in my website. So I will tell you that house is, and, and a part of me is gone with that house. And I was vehemently against it. As it happens, I live three doors down as well. So I watched that house go from the beauty that it is, and forget about my bias to the inside of the house. Of course it was beautiful, I built it. Um, however, the, um, I watched that house go down piece by piece. And they did it del delicately, and they did it carefully, and they trucked it away, and I hope it didn't go to a landfill in Ohio. Okay, and I, I just, so, um, I was very upset, because, I saw a piece of history walk away. However, I wasn't so upset when I saw a pink brick 1950s or 60s house on the corner of Metacrest and um, in Lincoln go down and there's a brick and stone house there. So I don't think that there is a blanket um, a way of deciding. Now, I brought this up at the Planning Commission meeting uh, the original meeting that, that Michael Morris was supposed to present at when he withdrew at the end of the night, and, um, or before the end of the night, when he was asking permission to have his plans approved for the construction of the house. Now, he didn't need any permission to tear it down. And, and that was pretty clear. And I was approached to, to fight the tearing down. And I said, well, there's really nothing I can do. It hurts me, but there's nothing I can do. So I'd like to or propose a step back. And at that meeting, I had said to uh, Robert Lebo spoke about, hey, if we just include these homes in the historic district, this will prevent these issues coming up. Now, this issue, I think, is doing two things. It's tearing apart the community, but it's also bringing a lot of people together who had never probably talked to each other before. So, you know, there, there's, there's two sides of this. And I suggested at that meeting to uh, Commissioner uh, uh, Dr. Off, who also brought up, there's got to be a way to stop these teardowns. So my suggestion is, and I said it that night, is it necessary to umbrella with a historic district designation to prevent teardowns, which is the impetus for this whole situation that I think we're here for? I believe, and as I heard mentioned earlier by uh, Commissioner Olsman and, and a few others, that that was really the, the, what lit the fuse for this whole thing. So. Under that guise, is this the only way to protect our resources, as I'm hearing the verbiage, and I'm not aware of that, but um, you know, I'm becoming aware of that, is creating or enlarging and expanding in this historic district the only way? It may be. I don't know. But have we considered other ways of protecting houses that have historic value, whether Henry Ford's wife had their work done there, or whether someone was born in that house, or whatever the case may be. Is there another way to prevent teardowns that does not impose a whole host of other issues that come along with the historic district? Now, I know we're not here to consider anything else. However, I just need to bring that up because there's always alternatives. And I had said that night that if we start with a historic district, we're going to go back 10 years and we're going to, this whole community is going to be an uproar. And I predicted it, and, and I, it's, it's interesting it's playing out that way. So all I'm presenting to you now is that is there another possibility to, to um, qualify the, the ability of, for someone to tear down a house or not? This doesn't do it. Rather than creating a big umbrella historic district. And again, I'm not for or against. I'm just saying, have we exhausted all other possibilities? And, or maybe I'm wrong and there's other reasons for historic district. But I got an inkling that hearing what I hear and seeing what I saw, that that teardown was really what, what kind of started this and gave it, uh, you know, gave it legs. Well, you got to look at the master plan, too. So it was that. And, and I think that 
I think that the <coughs> city manager was very, very honest in her city manager's report uh, about what started us in that direction. But we had always planned on looking at expanding the historic district after reviewing of the first original historic district. So, and, and looking at studying that first district and actually looking at who has come before the district, who has gotten denied, who has come before the Planning Commission. I think you'd be very surprised to find out there is a lot more friction and a lot more work going through the Planning Commission is if you want to go through the historic district, now you might have a few people that I've had a couple complaints with, but not as many calls as I've had for the Planning Commission. So what I'm saying is that I think the historic district is getting sort of what you said, let's figure out, is there any other way? If there was, we would have prevented the Pembroke House from coming down. There wasn't. We knew there was no other, no other way to protect that house at that point. And, and hence, I had 50 calls telling me, you know, what about this? And, and this is sort of what brought the conversation, but it's always been in the master plan. Like, if you look at Pleasant Ridge and you look at the home values in Pleasant Ridge, the realtors here, Pleasant Ridge home values are stronger. Pleasant Ridge has the majority <coughs> of their houses are in a historic district. All of them. All of them. Thank you. All of them. I thought it was, but I didn't want to say that. Pleasant Ridge house values are stronger than our house values. So that's that's a, that's a fact. I'm just letting you know that houses and hunt. Not that it would be the same here. Could we connect it? But there are some things that we should. We I want to know because I want to be able to get myself based in, in the evidence and the research um, because I certainly don't want to put people through something if there's no value in doing that. Right. And I, again, I'm not speaking for or against, no, and I apologize if I'm, I'm thinking, you know, on a different track here, but no, it's if, great. if it, it appeared to me that this was all ignited by Milnerick's house <laughs> being torn down, and maybe it was just coincidental the timing was such, so that may be, if and forgive me. That, if, it's been an ongoing question posed by others. Milnerick's house may have been the, the, you the, know, the tipping However, so I just wanted to make sure that if we're looking at, is there another way to preserve teardowns, which is, you know, I think a big part of, of what, and, and I'll step down and, and No, I think it's a much. great question. I think it's one that when we go in, if, if it's the commission so chooses, that is definitely uh, an answer that we need to have answered. Mr. Lorry. Tom Lurie, uh, Huntington Woods, Dundee. Uh, let me first mention something. You keep mentioning the master plan suggests that we should be expanding uh, the historic district. That's not what I said. Somebody mentioned that? That's not what I said no. either. That's not what okay, I said. Okay, what did, what did somebody say about the master it's plan? On page 18 of the master plan. So why do we keep mentioning the master plan and expanding the historic district? We, you're put, you're correlating those two, those two statements together. That was not said tonight. Okay. The gentleman, I, yeah. Okay. I just want to make sure. Okay. I guess I jumped a little bit in saying that the master plan was suggesting that it was expanded. The master plan does speak to the historic district, correct? The master plan doesn't say anything specifically about expanding the historic district, correct? Yes, you're correct. Thank you. Doesn't the master plan is developed essentially for the community and presented <coughs> to the city commission, correct? It doesn't have that verbiage, expanding. It has the it's continued, uh, quality. yeah, I'm sorry, preservation and I don't know the exact words, but it has that we continue to preserve. Okay, my, my point was it. I felt like it was being suggested that the master plan. Could you extrapolate that? Possibly, but okay, and that's what I was getting from okay. that, and I don't think that that's actually what the master plan says. It was my point. Secondly, somebody asked about the cost of doing uh, a study, and I keep hearing the word volunteer. Yet, I understand the city resources were used in preparing a report, which was passed around earlier. When I say city <coughs> resources. 
copying employee time. Earlier this year, I understood, I was told that um, the employment here in the city offices has gone from 12 to 6 people and that people were under a lot of time constraints and stress from a lot of work. And I appreciate the fact that people have had to work a lot harder under difficult economic times. And so I question the fact that city resources, time, employee time, was used driving around and trying to figure out which houses might or might not meet certain criteria. It's a cost. And I don't think that this city is flush with cash. So I would suggest to you now that there are costs involved in going forward with a study. Now, somebody else suggested that we want to stop this before the train has left. But as somebody mentioned earlier, the train has already left the station. It left eight, ten years ago with the creation of the first historic district. Because Commissioner White, I heard you suggest that that was originally established with the idea that it would be expanded further. But as I recall at the original time, this was being suggested as a pilot, which we would revisit, and we would actually talk with the people that were in that historic district to see how they liked it. Yet I have not seen any empirical data suggesting that that was ever done. So to me, we're still at that pilot stage <coughs> with the first historic district. And I don't ever remember that we were going to do that with the idea of expanding it. It was just a pilot. As a matter of fact, I recall that that wasn't the intent. It's a little bit concerning. So one thing I would suggest, so I, I heard Martha, I don't remember your last name, discussing a lot of the historic value. And I thought, wow, that was really great. Her story was fantastic. We have lots of clubs here in Huntington Woods. And I think it'd be a great idea to start a club not affiliated with the city, not associated with the city. And this club could help add value to the city by doing the research that you suggest and getting that history. I think it'd be a great thing to do for a club. And those of people that are interested in it could go forward and, and get that information. Just, just an idea, just something to throw out there before we start putting resources in and letting that train leave the station forward to putting people into a situation which I don't think the majority of the people in this community want. Thank you. Ron, can I ask for a clarification? Can I ask clarification? Well, Hank, I think, would be the only one that maybe knows. Does this program stop demolition of a home if somebody wants to demo a home that's in the historic district? Yes, it can. Yes, it can stop you to demolish a home? Yes. Yes, if it's being sure. studied. Sure. Because, you know, you accidentally light a match to it then if you're inside the district? <laughs> 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 Okay, uh, we have two people, I think, left to speak, and um, I'm going to make that um, uh, Steve Behrman and Mr. Zeno, and that'll be the end of, the, oh, and uh, Mrs. Wibbleman, and that will will be the, did I get that wrong? Please. Okay, those will be the last question. three Can people. Can I ask a question? No, you've Thank already you. talked. Thank you. <laughs> okay, Steve, come on up. Steve Behrman again. Thank you. 2606600. Jules, I have to uh, <coughs> extend my apologies. Uh, I just want to preamble a little bit here. I was at another meeting when I was denied the ability to speak in accordance with the procedures of this body. And I was very frustrated at that. I didn't speak up. And I have learned that if you want to speak at these committees, at these, this commission, you have to speak up. Mr. Taylor was at the same meeting, and he was going to be denied his ability to speak, and he stood up and said something, and he got Why to speak. Why you Jules, the Jules, I will. And I know you know exactly what I'm talking about. So now you understand my frustration. I was denied the ability to speak at the time 
when I should have spoken in another meeting because the way the meeting is being run. I don't want that to happen again here to anybody. Um, first of all, I'll make a couple of observations. I wasn't going to really speak, but a few things came up. I thought it was interesting, Jules, you made a comment that you wanted to put windows in your house and you were denied. Sorry about that, but get ready, folks. Save me a bunch of money. I was that one it's okay. Money. Get ready, folks. Jules couldn't put windows in. His wife wanted windows. They were denied. Last block. Get ready. Go ahead. Uh, I agree with uh, Tom. I thought the same thing, that there should be individuals within the community. Martha, I know you. I like you very much. I think you're a proud of him fantastic historian. Nothing's holding you back. The city would probably love that information if you're able to get, gather it for us. I think that that's a point that should not be uh, connected with this meeting tonight. Uh, I want to address a few other homes on Henry. I live on Henry. Uh, I want to address the Zimmerman home, which is almost directly across the street from me. The Wiesenthal's home was there before. That home was a wreck. You would not have found a family to move into that home uh, unless that home was demolished. Uh, that would not have been able to occur. And now we have a beautiful home, the Zimmerman home. I want to address the Saxe home, which there sat a French colonial, which some people uh, thought had significant value to it. Mr. Saxe demolished that home. He put up a beautiful home, which now we have an opportunity for that beautiful home of Mr. Saxe's to now become, as we move forward in another 50 or 75 years, probably have a huge distinguished history that that home would not be able to have if that other home that preceded it was not torn down. And I want to tell you something, you are denying the ability for this evolution to occur. Um, Mr. Beerman, those are your opinions. That's not fact on the front. It home. isn't. And the thing. So the, you're just what, saying. What is an opinion that people did not want that home? I've heard comments before. Right. By people. I'm just saying that you're just you're just letting us know. So don't make it sound like that is that is that was the rule. But you're saying that no one would have bought that house and fixed it up. We don't know that. You I'll know? tell you. So. I, I saw the house. I've been in the house. I was in the backyard of the house, Mary. Let me tell you something. That house detracted from the value of the homes on that block and was a home that you would not want to live in. Right. Okay, forward. so I, I, unless you've been in it, you're in the backyard, you visit the people, you've been in the house. Well, anyways, that was the case of that house. Um, it probably couldn't even have been rehabilitated. It was pretty interesting on the inside. Um, I think that part of this process, if a study is going to go forward, would be to distribute a survey to the affected property owners, the proposed affected property owners, the owners of homes that are being studied. I think that if, before you impose something on them, and it is an imposition, you should ask them what they want. Give them a fact sheet and ask these people what they would like. And I know this and has Mr. been Mr. Fairman, that's what we're saying. We need a fact sheet. We need to get the facts. We don't I have don't think those. That I, would you be interested if I went and distributed a survey to every one of these homes and tabulated it and presented it to you? Would that be of interest? It would to be you? of no interest because they have no idea what the historic district value is, mm -hmm. what it is in their house. So we don't have the well, you study. Don't, you don't either. You're right. So, I don't. And you won't even after this, uh, after this study. Martha can perform the study and present all this interesting information good, to you. I'll, I have questions that were raised here, concerns you have that no, were You have no interest in knowing what, you, you just made a statement I find highly unusual, okay. Okay. that you have no interest in knowing what property, affected property owners feel individually. You, you really don't? Uh, you know something? I want them to make a decision based on the facts, not just a random, do you want to be in a historic district and reading from next door neighbor, inaccurate data. I want them to have the right <coughs> communication and the right answers to make a good decision. You're That's what I want. That's fine. Would you be interested in this? In I'm not going to, you know what, I'm, it's the I commission guess, okay. here, so I'm not, uh, it's not a bit, I'm, I'm done speaking. Okay. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank I you. really appreciate it. That, uh, and Mr. You, uh, Zeno, you want to come up? Okay. Ken Zeno, 8634 Huntington. Um, perhaps the commissioner should dissolve the people and elect a new one. However, um, I have one simple question. 
and one comment. Can I ask, how come you have to start it off? Mary, why don't you oh, let Mr. Zeno talk? Let, let's get this how, how refreshing. There was an assertion made on that website that you impugned that said that the last meeting of the historic district was not properly conducted and the minutes were not posted. And it violates the Open Meetings Act of Michigan. Can the city attorney address that? What? No, I have no information on that whatsoever. What was He's that explaining the last historic district commission, commission meeting was? was the, the meeting no minutes were not posted, and they're in, in, in due manner, in proper time. And my understanding of open meetings is that this is in violation of the Open Meetings Act. I would like an answer in writing from the city attorney on this. And one other thing, since it's pretty clear that nobody here has ever, ever read Robert's Rules of Order, I would like a clarification from the city attorney because, Ms. White, you have recognized me under a normal item of business and under Robert's Rules of Order as I read them, I have this floor until I yield. No. 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 <laughs> okay. Absolutely untrue. Okay. okay. Then enlighten me. It's Mayor Pro Tem White. Thank you very much. <laughs> Mayor Pro Tem White, I am sorry. Thank you. As for your first question, um, I serve at the di direction of the city commission. So if the city commission wants me to perform legal work to answer questions, they will ask me to do so. As to the second, under Robert's Rules of Order, what it basically says is that with respect to this commission, they operate under the rules that they set, okay? This commission can set its own rules as to who can speak, when they can speak, and how long they can speak. Where is it posted? Open, where is what posted? The rules that the commission is working the under. The rules that they're operating under right now are in the bottom of this. Right, okay. and then as I understand it, under Robert Rules of Order, this is a normal item of business. I have been recognized no. by the chair, which means I have the floor until I yield. That is not accurate, Mr. Zeno. Not even close to accurate. In fact, well, I think it's not a filibuster. In, in fact, you don't have to be recognized at all. Three minutes. Okay. She was told. I actually outlined that. You're using the word three three minutes before we all started speaking. Okay. Well, I would welcome a memo of clarification on that so everybody can understand. Go online and look up Robert's Rules of Order, print them out, Google them. It'll t you can limit the amount of time speakers can, otherwise the meeting could go on ad infinitum. You Robert deny Robert's people, order. wait, Carol, you deny people the opportunity to speak when you allow that. If you say, well, I'm not leaving until I'm done talking, I mean. So I am not denying anybody, anybody else an opportunity to speak. Mr. Zeno, let me talk. That's not how Roberts works. Obviously, you're not familiar with Roberts' rules of order. I am. So if you want to look it up, you'll find that the body can determine how long people should speak. So why don't you address the issue at hand, like everyone else has, if you have anything to contribute. The issue at hand is the specific question whether you violated, in the historic commission, the public meetings act. It's, that's the issue, and that's the question. I'm the minutes in, in a timely fashion. Correct. We will respond. We will, Thank we, you. The city will respond to that inquiry. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close up this discussion. Do we have one? Uh, oh, I'm sorry, Mrs. Wilberman. I'm I'm sorry. Please come up. I, I, you know, it's been a long night. Thank you. Hi, I'm Louise Wibbleman. I live at eight eight zero nine Huntington. Um, I also was an original member of the historic districts. Study Committee serving as vice chair. I also served for several terms on the Historic District Commission. Um, I have been vice chair of the zoning board and I am current chair of the zoning board. I've devoted a lot of volunteer hours to all of those um, positions and I would donate ten times more because I really enjoy uh, dedicating my time and helping the city be better, be a better place. Um, I 
purchased the house at 8736 Borgman, the big white house on the hill. And I can tell you that there were a lot of things that we had to come before the HDC in order to improve. The windows and in addition, I know that there are lots of houses in the historic district that have had significant work done on them, all approved by the HDC under uh, the time when I was on the commission and beyond. I find it funny that people are questioning why the historic district commission would want to set up a historic district study committee when that's the exact thing that they're supposed to do. The tree commission, the tree board is supposed to look at trees. Fundraising boards are supposed to look at fundraisers. So I'm not sure why the emotions that are boarding, uh, you know, the border on hysteria before we really even know what we're looking at. Um, so I would encourage you to go ahead and set the study committee because we have found um, through our many hours of research at the Oakland County, in the basement of Oakland County, here at the city hall, all around the neighborhood, looking at the blueprints, um, so many interesting things, things, houses that can't be replicated. Um, given the cost constraints of 21st century. Uh, so anyway, I just wanted to end this uh, session on that note. Um, I think it's a good thing for the city, and it, as you said, it just offers us the opportunity to really look at what we have and then to make an informed, educated decision. Uh, Mrs. Webelman. Yes. Can, I, can I ask you a few questions? Sure. Uh, you expanded the Borgman home by how many square feet? Uh, almost double. Okay, so you added how many additional feet, roughly? About 2,000. About 2,000. Was that a new addition or was it an existing building? Uh, it, was a, it was a new addition. Uh, there's a lot of fear in general that, one, you can't expand homes and two, that you can't build uh, new buildings that match the old building. That's the only reason I asked the question. So. Yeah, I, you know, um, several of my neighbors have put significant additions, or my old neighbors have put significant additions on their houses. Um, even one of the most, I'm going to say, coveted houses, the Aero Serenin, first um, residential commission was approved for a large addition, even though that, um, I don't believe to this uh, date, has been constructed. Uh, we had originally um, planned to come to the commission for the Branton House um, to replace all the windows because they were in such a state of disrepair and dry rot. They were in 20 different pieces, but looking at the new um, products that were being put into the addition that we had, it just didn't make sense to put the new product um, in the old building, so we purchased matching windows, and it just, you know, it just made the whole thing come together. The historic district is not something to be scared of. It's something to embrace because you know things will, um, with thought and planning, will mostly remain the same. The Zorowski's house just sold. Uh, they're on Huntington, your neighbors, for more than almost $570,000. And I think that's more than twice what they paid for it. So in my experience, yes, historic districts are a benefit to the whole community. Um, I've looked at all, you know, there, is a, there are a lot of houses they want to study. 800 is a lot. I think the original study we had was 500, and we whittled it down to just the 108 best examples. So, you know, I think it needs to be, um, the study committee needs to be uh, done with thought so that they really don't bite off more than they can chew because it, it was a lot of hours. And 
I would um, encourage everybody who's here who is not an advocate of the historic district to attend, if you decide to see the historic district study committee, to find out what really goes on because it's nothing to be scared of. Um, it's, uh, it's a benefit to the community and all of the residents that live in those houses. So, thank you. Thank you. And I'll let you continue with your meeting. Thank you. And I want to thank everybody for their input tonight. And uh, remember, the mayor's been doing this for 32 years. I'm doing this for one meeting, so uh, be patient. So I'm um, glad that we're finished with that. Um, may I consider a, a motion from the commission on this issue after discussion? Enter a motion, anybody? Personally, I, th I think we need to do a little more research before we make a motion on, on what to do here. Um, I, I think the rest of the commission might not agree with me, but I, I think we need to look at what has been proposed here. Um, I still think it's a lot of homes to ask a study group to study. I think that we can narrow this down to a smaller area, and I would still like to see the Historic District Commission before a committee is um, is formed, to st before a study committee is formed, a Historic District Commission to hold a public hearing once we finalize what area we would like them to study, send out invitations to that group and get some feedback from the residents that are involved, let them know the process that we're thinking about doing and hear what they have to say and then move forward from there. Yeah, motion to table. I, I will make that unless there's somebody other thoughts at the table. I'm gonna s i am would be I'd be willing to second that motion to table. I think we just need to narrow the focus a little bit more. Uh, I fully support the concept of of a study, but I wanna know the the focus of it a little bit more. And I, I think I agree it needs to be more tailored than to say hundred houses are gonna be looked at. It's, it's too broad. It's too broad. It needs to be narrow. I'll make, I'll make a motion to table for now. Support. How, how do you want this to be narrowed down? Right. How do you want it directed, I guess? Well, I think that's we the just benefit table. of the motion to table. I don't have the answer as I'm sitting here, but I want more. I agree with Bob. We need to look at it more carefully. We need to, how far down it gets tailored, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that, but I want to vote for something one way or another that I'm not clear on what I'm, I don't like that kind of deal. And that's what I feel I have here, is fall or nothing. And I think we need to slow it down, look at it, and decide if, if we're going to do it, what's the, what's the scope? And I don't, like I said, I don't have enough information here. I think we need a, probably a little more, uh, more of a public forum, a little more public airing I feel there's a, a lot of confusion about the steps to establish the study for a historic district. I live across the street from two of those 15 additions that have come into the city. Each of you that are here presently believe that you're the only people that buy, sell, and expand homes. If you were to read the master plan, which is being completed, you would find that we have the highest speed and increase in property values up until 2008, 2010 when everything tanked. That when a realtor or a speculator looks at where to make money, you can buy a house in Huntington Woods, rip it down. Your objective then is to not make it more beautiful than what it was, but to make it as inexpensive to sell it and maximize your profit 
That's outrageous to even say that, sir, about your neighbors. Uh, it wasn't my neighbor. My neighbor Jeff, died. Jeff, Jeff, Jeff. Just let's the stay two, excuse me, I'm the just, two Jesus. nephews bought the property when they came to the planning commission. It was not a historical. When they came to the planning commission, they proposed two identical suburban homes, 55% siding, looking exactly the same, and 33 foot wide, three car garages. They got pushed back a little. They also built on higher ground by building a hill. So when we had the flooding, they weren't flooding, but they did add to the water that went into your drains. What We're making, what excuse me. Excuse me, Commissioner. the address he's talking to. Commissioner, it, it's not for a debate. He's making okay. a comment. Commissioner, comments are to be Sorry. made and respected. Please go ahead. You're Mr. asking what do you do and how do you do it. All I'm saying is there has been an assumption that the only people that will expand homes or change homes are the people that live here. And the, the statement is, trust your neighbor. And I do trust my neighbor. But these were two nephews that inherited a home. They didn't live in Huntington Woods. They had no idea. They never moved into those homes. It was to maximize profit. The homes that come before the planning commission, very frequently the people that have the hardest times are the ones that buy your home, tear it down, want to put in additional footage because yes, the homes are old. They want to do it as cheaply as they can. And that's what you're up against. You're not up against your neighbors. If you count, actually, it's 25 homes in the last 10 years. I believe 10 of them were replacements, or 15, whatever it is. We also had, from 2008, virtually until last year, a collapse in the market. So people weren't going out and doing the same thing. But Huntington Woods can be pulled down, as well as pulled up. I have a letter it would take too much time and actually comes from the from the, the state historic office, which explains in more detail some of the things that you poo-pooed about. There's no value increase, etc. Um, I would like to see the delay and will support a tabling. So this can be wider discussed and people can understand what we are asking to do. We are asking to have basically an audit of homes. First of all, everything that's in the historic district, if it has no historic value, is not controlled in the same way a historic district home is. The last time we proposed a historic district, the major attorneys from every law firm were lined up against that wall. And what they told me as a new commissioner was, you're doing a takings. You're taking away my property and my property rights. So I spent a year, I went to Michigan State, and I became a citizen's planner. Zoning laws and what's occurred have been going on for 5,000 years. You do not have your own complete rights. The cheapest way to water the lawn would be to drill a well. There's water below the city. You can't do it. It's in our ordinance. You're stopped from that. Uh, you can't do fracking, but it would be nice if I could sell my mineral rights so I could make a profit because I'm retired. You, have, you can't build a house or an addition that takes away the light from your neighbors. That goes back to Rhode Island, the 1500s. We've already given up a lot of rights. What's neat about Huntington Woods and the historical homes, 
Many of them are smaller scale copies of Palmer Woods. And they are unique. And the Wimbledon home is a classic example of all of the fears, but they reverse themselves. People are told you can't expand your house. You can't change the windows. You can't do this. You can't do that. When you drive by the Bratton house, it's gorgeous. And it's twice the size of what it used to be. And it never was a bungalow to begin with. It was a banker's home who chose to be here almost 100 years ago. Um, we need people, more people to understand what this discussion is about and some of the facts about what you can and you can't do. So I, I support the table. Okay, can I call for a vote on the motion that's on the floor right now, please? Motion to table. Mm -hmm. Aye. 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 Is there any additional information? I think Bob mentioned, I think we should put it there that he felt that the 800 homes are too many. Then I think the Swivelman said also that maybe we should scale down what we're looking at and make sure it's a very important area, which is going to take. I mean, do you want staff to come up with an arbitrary percentage of, of resources and narrow it down that way? You want to give us input on what you think? I mean, when, when there's when there's more data available to get input, yes. But I don't want. I'm not going to do that here. And I'm all for talking, but I don't know what I'm talking about. But not right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's I right. do it all the time. I thought it was a good thing to do. With well, yeah. At, at so this what, point, we're asking. We'd have to do a study to get more information other than the, the windshield review that we've done to kind of give they you just a drove around. <laughs> so. I just think we need to table it. Slow down. Back off, take a look at it, and see you know what is a feasible amount, and you know do it in a way that everyone knows what we're doing, and move from there. Okay. All right. Um, next on the agenda um, is the um, one zero zero nine nine eleven Mile Road matter for consideration of the redevelopment of a study conducted by uh, Carlisle and Wartman uh, Associates regarding uh, the property on eleven Mile Road, formerly known as Sam's Market. Uh, we had just Ben Ben Ben's here. I'm trapped right now. Okay, <laughs> I'll be on in a second. Okay, Mr. Carlisle will come to the. We had had this on the uh, agenda last month, uh, asking for direction from the council as to whether or not you want us to proceed with trying to sell the property or lease the property. The uh, return on investment um, will be different under each scenario. Uh, at that time, you decided to table it, uh, but you did ask us to pursue uh, the, the interest level of the 11 or 12 individuals that had submitted um, uh, proposals we did hear and we did set that out the following that week and we did hear from one uh, it is a proposal for a convenience store probably similar to what was already there when it was occupied as Sam's market that has been the only proposal that we have received thus far um, from somebody that's interested in, in developing that property So again, at this point, we're looking for direction, whether or not you want us to pursue that particular well, development. I, I think if you have, if, in, in, from what I understand about this, our goal is to get a tax-paying, revenue-positive, revenue-producing entity into <coughs> that market who will, whoever the owner is, who's going to uh, enhance the appearance of the market and create a viable business there for himself, herself, and in turn benefit the whole area. Um, and so I, I guess that that depends on, the proposal depends on, you know, who, what, you know, what their economic viability is, what, you know, what they've got in mind. I mean, I think the term convenience store, when you say that, um, that's what we had. It wasn't so great, especially the last few years. Um, you know, I don't know. We've over the years that the same just.
so everybody here knows that Sam's Market has been going on for oh, the last five years. Um, very difficult scenario. Alex Alley managed that on his own, including after he retired. He was the one that struck the deal with the owners to finally get a situation where the city could step in and purchase it because the concern was that it was becoming further deteriorated uh, week after week. Uh, Hank did everything he could to uh, enforce code there by practically sit, you know, by almost on a daily basis to make sure that this place didn't become a uh, blighted out eyesore on 11 Mile. So the question now is what do we do with it? We own it. Um, and I'm all, <coughs> my own personal view, I'd like to sell it. I think that should be in private hands, personally. I don't think the city, I'm not interested in seeing the city be a landlord. Conversely, I'm not sure what the market will bear in terms of somebody buying it. But all I want to do is uh, make sure that whoever does it had, knows what they're getting into, you know, knows their competition is Westbourne. You know, it's not, you know, for those of you who don't know the story of Sam's, I believe the city actually gave the property to the family after World War II because people in this area wanted a market. They wanted a store to go to. And uh, Mr. Sloan, back in the day, there wasn't a lot of choice about where to go. And people used Sam's, they frequented it, it was a neighborhood establishment. Boom, along comes Westbourne, Holiday, all these high-end markets, people flock to those. Uh, I gotta tell you, Frank's down the street in Berkeley does a land office business, land office business. So it's hard to say that a party store or a convenience store, whatever you call it, can't be successful because Frank's on, on 11 Mile west of Coolidge, like I said, I've never been in there that there hasn't been a line at the cash register, it's amazing. But it also has relatively high-end stuff and it's well appointed and everything like that. But yeah, it's got to be somebody that's got the money to do it, and that we we're not. I don't want to take up risk here. I don't want another. I don't want a second failure in there. Well, there's, there's there are really four options that we laid out in the report, and um, those include leasing the building for a retail or commercial tenant, um, selling the building for a re retail or commercial tenant, um, selling the property for residential use, or keeping the property for some sort of public use expansion of the park, community center, something like that. Um, after our initial discussion, really there were two options that came out, um, really two viable options that came out. That was leasing the property for commercial um, or selling the property for commercial. Um, whatever direction the commission goes, um, obviously this will require much more study and due diligence both on, on my behalf as well as the city manager's behalf. Um, in regards to the leasing, um, we, did send, we uh, did send out letters to the applicants that did inquire about the property. Um, we got one response back. The city has not actively marketed the property at all. These are simply people that have come to the city seeking interest in that property. Um, in terms of uh, future marketing, the city can also can go ahead and market the property for lease if that's the direction of the commission, and we can see what other viable tenants there might be out there. Um, in regards to this convenience store, um, you are, you're correct. We definitely have to do some more due diligence with the applicant, find out their marketing plan, their business plan, and because essentially the city becomes a, a landlord you are controlling the property. Um, but with that, you also have control of the property. So you can control the tenant, you can control what goes on in the, in the, in the operation, um, and you can control the future use of that property. So that does give you a little more options in the future. If you do want to decide to lease it out, you do have future control of the property. So it really, we're at the pleasure of the commission in terms of what you want to do with the property. If you want to explore uh, leasing options, or if you want to explore the selling of the property. There are pros and cons to each option. I think before we hire a broker, which I'm not against doing. I mean, that's what I think, we, frankly, I've been sort of hoping we would do that all along, if, you know, whoever it is. I mean, that's the only way you're going to know by marketing it aggressively who you're going to get. We know that, like the national chains, for instance, people always say, well, wouldn't that be great for Starbucks? Starbucks wants a turnaround. They want you. They want to drive through. They want a lot of property now. And, you know, Starbucks, seems to me, doesn't put a store in anywhere that they can't tell you exactly how many lattes they're going to sell that day by the time of the day. You know, like the one they built on Woodward on the east side and one on the west side, they don't care. Two different, as far as they're concerned, two different customer bases, one going north, one going south. But I just want somebody in there that we don't have to worry about, somebody that's got the money to run it, a, a good plan to 
run a business, and like I said, I just want it to be revenue positive. I just want money coming in. As right now, we're not losing anything, we're not gaining anything. We stopped the blight, we stopped the threat, and that was what my major concern was all along. If you, if you lease the property, you obviously get the lease and you know, the, the revenue from the rent. You do not collect property tax on it because it would still be in city hands. So there is an offset of leasing it versus what you would collect in the property yeah, tax. You collect rent. You yeah, collect rent, rent correct. Right. I, I will note, I just want to give some background. We did interview um, seven to ten real estate professionals in regards to this property. Um, all of them came back with they, they think it would be hard pressed to find a national retail right. tenant that would go into the nation. Um, they said if it's going to be something commercial or retail, it's going to be a local entrepreneur who takes that, takes that opportunity. So. And I think that we had a discussion. I think that. Um, it's just yeah. Ron and you. And it I was know. just the three of us. Uh, you guys were not here at the. We did have that, and and I think uh, uh, Commissioner Paul. I, I think that we felt that one of the things that was discussed that it was attached to the park, hmm. and that obtaining that has taken a long time. And like like you said, that um, it took a lot of a lot of work, a lot of hours of the city manager. We have that property. It's not just a piece of property. It's a piece of property attached to the park. You know, it has that park option. So it has a, a lot of value. Personally, I would like to see us go out to a broker and see some plans, uh, viable, look at a good business plan. Uh, I know people really want to see that utilized. And I think when I saw that in um, talking to a city manager, it was an upscale convenience store. I don't know what that meant, but that was in the direction. It wasn't just the convenience store, but you're correct. So I thought I was going to hear something tonight a little bit about that, but you don't know any more about we, the... We, we, um, between the time we had the last meeting and tonight, we sent out letters to the people that had um, expressed interest. Right. We had like nine. Uh, seven, something something seven. of that nature. And we only got one response back, and we okay. just got that back this week, I believe, or, mm -hmm. or late last week. So we have not had time to vet it. Or meet with them in person and go over. Is there market bear will bear another convenience store around here? No, I, you know I'm I'm not a market real estate expert by any means. I, I again I would if you do want to open the, the the property up for leasing to other to other avenues, I would explore the option of hiring a broker. Um, ben, can I just clarify from the last minute mm -hmm. when the question was asked about selling right now? I think if and please um, clear. Make very clear that you said that we would that we what might take a hit if we were to sell it at this point. Well, the 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 you bought the property for the appraised value, which was mm -hmm. two hundred and seventy thousand, or in that range. Right. Um, just speaking to the people that we have spoken to, um, the developers and brokers, they felt that that price might, you might not get that return back. That's on, what you on, said at the last on your meeting. Price. Thank you. Um, the market value and what people pay for is, is sometimes different than what the appraised right. value might right. be. Um, you might get more, but they said they think more more likely you'll get less than the 270 at this at this current point in the market. Now, hasn't been up. From, we don't know. So it hasn't been it hasn't put on been put on the market yet. But that's just what we're hearing from people that we talked to. Why don't we? My I would make a motion to uh, have the city manager <coughs> or finance director or whoever is going to do this evaluate the vi viability of the plan that we've been approached with. And the prospective tenant slash owner, and um, see what that is before we hire a broker. Because mm -hmm. I agree. you know I'm not. I mean, uh, I'm all. You know, I like a lot of real estate brokers and everything. That's fine. But if it saves the taxpayers money by not doing that, and we get the same result. I think we're money ahead. So, well, we we also get the option, at least if it's uh, rented or leased that we have the option to expand the park. But we, won't we own that. the property. But that's why I'm saying we have the option to take that building down completely well, we own and expand it. the park. Well, we had uh, significant talk about condemnation that went on for a long time, and they stayed one step ahead of us on condemnation. One step ahead for, for like a two-year period of time. We did because, you know, we were getting so... Uh, flustered by the inability to get anywhere with with the owners. So now we got it. it. It came, it was in tax sale. We were watching it. We thought we were going to get it out of tax, twice out of yeah. tax sale. <laughs> Beat us both, both times, right, you know, at the last, at the last minute. So, 
If, if, if That's you, my motion is to let's consider the first proposal that we have. If it's viable and it's a good deal, then we go. If it's not, then we hire a broker. Do we have a second? I'll second that. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Sancho? <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. For those of you who haven't yeah. seen the report, I believe it's available, isn't it? On is it on the website. Uh yeah, it would have been in the commission packet last month. You'd have to go to the website and look up the January commission packet. It's it's very thorough Anybody analysis. Any questions on that? On yeah. this? Pardon? Any open on this? Yeah. At this point, what do you mean? Is it, I don't you want to be out on protocol. Oh, you're up. Oh, you're up. All right. Come on up. I didn't see. How many didn't square recognize. feet is this building? Uh, good Anybody? question. Do you know what you're going to call? 4,500. 4,500. And how many parking spots? Uh, seven or eight. No. 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 22. On each side. I mean, there, there's two sides. There's an alley there. Probably, I'm going to so say 18, maybe. So it's least as an office facility. 20, as well as the market. Yes, it, it could be, be in could be. Correct. Well, I was only hearing my we pitch. Had no, no, no. We had, there were, there were, I think there was a PT clinic that was interested in it. There, there have been some, I believe at one point there were some, seven there were some off, dentists that were interested. There were some medical use interest in it. Sure. I think we can sell it without doing the broker and paying their fee. And be well, that's what we're looking at. Well, well, I'll take that into my own consideration. Thank you. Okay. You interested? Yeah. Um, I mean, there might be value in coming to the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's a better deal than something. Sure sure in the meantime, why don't you just put a sign in the window that says for sale or lease with a city number because we're wasting all this time. Yes. That's a good you idea. Know. Put your number. <laughs> <laughs> Great idea, Linda. That's a good idea. Great idea. Yes. And then, you know, you'll get, there's a lot of traffic. There's, you're going to get I more interest. Yes. Yeah. I agree. They had that sign in the window for a long time. <laughs> Three years. They didn't get too much traffic. <laughs> <laughs> you talk to this. No, yeah. I'm talking to the gentleman okay. with the red flint. Yeah. Thank you. I just wanted to, to ask, uh, just for clarification, who this gentleman is and what, who is he representing or what's the, uh, I just don't know for whom he's working or any oh, of Oh, Ben? The, yeah. The, the, yeah. Great question. Okay. Um, uh, ben, you want to come up and introduce? Sure. He introduced himself at the last commission meeting and a couple meetings before. Yes, yeah, so. the third or fourth meeting. Um, I'm Ben Carlisle, Carlisle Warren Associates. We have been recently retained as the uh, city's planning consultant. Thank you. Yeah. Planning in a what? Urban planning. Plan city planning. Planning. Okay. And uh, Mrs. Case? I just have a, a. Come on up to the. Oh. Thank you. Uh, exercise. I have knee trouble, so I know. every time I have to do this, go ahead. I, this is just a, a, a sort of off the cuff. The, the person who owns the, I don't even know what it's called, the market on Woodward, is it S&W or S&M? That's a movie, honey. No. <laughs> that, was oh, no, that was Mr. Oh, no, that was Mr. Bashara's place in those Yes, parts. yes, 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 yes. No, no, no. This is the this is the market that's just just south of Lincoln on the east side. GNS. 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 Thank you. Anyway, he we've chatted on occasion when I stopped in there for something, and he had expressed a very serious interest in buying the property. Yeah. And I just don't know whether, I mean, I, I never said anything because I'm obviously not a go-between, but I, it, if he knew, yes. I, I don't know his name, he's a very nice man, he owns a house right behind that market and it's always very clean and well run. That's it. Let him know. Right here at this gentleman. Forgive me, I'm naive. Um, what is it costing the city and the taxpayers to retain the consultant to evaluate everything that's been done? We, we didn't retain uh, Carlisle. They are our planners. We interviewed planning because for we, everything. yeah, we, it's planning. part of the city that you have a planning for your master plan and that. Okay. And we interviewed, it was time for our 
Yeah. All right, so, so we actually interviewed, I think, five different firms mm -hmm. to come in. And since Bonnie Cook was our planner, so we came in and, and um, I was part of the planning commission, so we interviewed five firms right. and chose them to... to uh, okay. I guess more to my point is, what is the evaluation of that property costing the taxpayers? Because when we look at the whole picture, we paid 270 plus all the holding costs, and there's certainly a certain amount of holding costs that... He also made money because he sold all the refrigeration units in it. No, that fraction that, that, that's fraction of what I'm curious about. Right. thought they were worth right. that, so. I'm just curious, that, you know, to know what, as a citizen and a taxpayer, what that, where that building lies. Maybe we privatized a staff person. So it's a contractual relationship okay. that we have for a required function of city government. Planning, the master Planning plan. Uh, oh, no, I understand Planning. that. I understand he that. Just wants to know well, I, as I understand it, we pay, it's a, it's a contractual uh, per diem, or, or not per diem, but per hour or whatever it is. I, I'm just trying to boil this down to, in the end, what is, how many hours what is the cost of, of this building is, is really the bottom line. What is the cost in addition to what our, our cause I don't know. I'm not, ch I'm not trying to be, no. I'm, I'm just it curious. Can't all be down to I'm a business man no. too, yeah, so I'm yeah, curious yeah. to know. I, I would bet there's a, a, a record keeping of hours spent on everything they do for the city because that's the way it typically operates. So I'm just curious to know as to how, what costs we've incurred related to that building and I'll sit down after all right, I'm going to wrap up this now. Um, it's getting late. I don't think anybody else wants to speak. Correct? Okay, thank you. Um, so we had a motion on the floor. Or did we vote on it? Okay. okay. So, sorry, that's right. We thank you. Sorry, for thank public you. participation. Thank you. Thank you. It's all right. I, sorry, I didn't mean to let anybody down. Um, Doing great. Resolution. Um, R, it's number four on your agenda, 2015 matter of consideration. Oh, let's go to number uh, three. Let's go to three first. Boards and Commission of uh, Committee appointees, matter of appointing residents to fill vacancies on various boards and commissions and committees. We had interviews before the meeting, so we were here interviewing people who want to volunteer on, on um, positions that we have available. And I think we came to some decisions, uh, yeah. Commissioner Jenks. Yeah, I'd uh, move to uh, appoint Linda Solomon to the Board of Review as second alternate position. You want to do them as a block? Uh, Sam Pernick uh, to the Environmental Advisory Board and Christy Conti to the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board. I'll second that motion. Second. Perfect. <laughs> Okay, and I'm going. Oh, let's let's vote on that. So, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, so that goes. I'd like to also, um, uh, in in the mayor's absence, uh, um, this is a mayoral appointment. Appoint Marjorie Cohn to the ethics board. Um, I'll make a motion to approve the mayoral appointment. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? And if I can just make a statement here on the record, I mean, uh, in the mayor's absence, mm -hmm. you do serve as the mayor. Uh, generally, I think as a matter of policy, when it's a mayoral appointment, we probably want the mayor to do that. But given the circumstances tonight, I didn't see any problem with this proceeding forward, but it's not setting any precedent moving forward for the city. Since he's never misses. And I would and like. He's never gone. I would love to <laughs> bring up um, a matter that Claire brought to my attention, and that is the BART board uh, currently is supposed to have 11 members, and she is suggesting that it be reduced to nine because that's a rather large board. And we're having a hard time getting uh, people to fill those vacancies. We currently have eight, so even if it went from 11 to nine, we'd still have one vacancy, but I'd, uh, I'd like to. See that reduced officially. Would, uh, Commissioner, entertain a motion. So. Uh, excuse me. I'd like to uh, table that to the next meeting because it was not presented on the agenda. Anybody want a second? I'll second that. Yes. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, great. We'll table that. 
and make sure that gets on our next agenda. All right, no problem. Okay, um, now, number four on your agenda, um, matter of consideration of the Public Works Mutual Aid, Michigan WARN, the Michigan Water um, Waste Water Agency Response Network. I'd like to um, ask City Manager um, Amy to discuss that, please. Sure. Uh, mutual aid packs are something that cities rely on um, a lot. You're probably familiar with police and fire mutual aid. There's also DPW mutual aid, and this would just be another group that we would join uh, where we could be able to perhaps tap into the resources of a water, wastewater agency. We could have maybe used uh, resources for the Water Resource Commission um, uh, when we were dealing with the flood recovery, so we would like to become a, a member of this as an additional tool uh, in case of... Um, you know, we have another uh, emergency and we need, need recovery efforts and uh, additional equipment and support. And that the uh, agreement has been reviewed by the city attorney. And the cost is? No cost. No cost. It's free. So I just wanted to bring that up. So can I make a motion, and someone to enter, entertain a motion? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank motion you. passed. Uh, next thing, did anybody want to discuss that? It's a little late. I'm sorry. It's uh, uh, already uh, passed. We're hmm? loosely, you know. I mean. uh, matter of approving the collection of the 2015 summer property taxes for the Berkeley School District and authorizing an annual agreement. I entertain a motion. So moved. Support. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passed. Looking at reports and minutes, um, will someone make a, want to make a motion? Motion approve. to approve the minutes as presented? Or accept them, actually? Accept them, thank you. <laughs> Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Accepting, passed. Now we're down to warrant number uh, 294. Um, I'll make a motion to approve uh, warrant 294 subject to full audit. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Warrant number 294 passes. Can I ask what warrant 294 is? Bills. Uh, the bills. The bills. bills. The bills. The bills. The bills. The bills. So, all right, um, this is the time, again, for public participation of anything that was not on the agenda. Oh, what? Well, go ahead. <laughs> you want to make it smith sure. Kevin Lewis, I'm still not telling you where I live. <laughs> what was the name of Sam's Market I when I was a kid, when it was a candy store, and it was now, a house? <laughs> the name of Sam's Market was not since I know. No, I didn't live here. Anyway, right. I was here, but I don't we'll remember. Try to get, we'll try to get that information to you no, that was like cool when I get Sorry. your address. Okay. Um, any other public participation? Anybody else? Hello? Okay, let's go right to the city manager report. Yes, I'm going to go fast. Um, <laughs> I, uh, the, I've informed the commission, I don't know if the rest of the uh, city knows, but our Parks and Rec Director Nancy Waldman submitted her resignation last week. She has accepted a position with the district court, so she will be, her uh, last day will be at the end of February. So we will be placing ads and uh, interviewing for um, a new Parks and Rec Director to fill that position. Uh, the next two commission meetings coming up are a little, a uh, little different than usual. Uh, on the 17th of February, instead of the regular commission meeting, that'll be the uh, presentation of the 696 walkability charrette uh, that the Woodward Avenue Action Committee and the City of Pleasant Ridge have uh, put together. So uh, I don't remember the times right off the hand, but I, I sent it to you in an email. So on the 17th. Um, uh, there will be the meeting in Pleasant Ridge. The meeting after that on March 3rd will be the joint Berkeley Oak Park School District meeting, and it will be held at 7 p.m. at the library on March the 3rd. 
Um, and then just coming up, we have a communication advisory committee meeting this Thursday. There is a BART meeting next Wednesday. We still have a vacancy on that, um, that committee if somebody's interested in filling that. And then the Zoom informational meeting will be on the 12th. And that Do we know where that zoo will be, the, where the meeting is? Is it in the Ford Auditorium? It's not. I don't remember the name of the building, but... Uh, we'll put it on the website Wild to make Lessons sure that... Wildlife Preserve Gallery. Is it? Okay. Wildlife, yeah, just a couple. Wildlife Preserve Gallery. That's and the the e-newsletter that goes out on Friday will um, we'll have that. The specifics on there. Thank you. Okay, uh, let's start with Commissioner Reports. Um, we'll start with uh, Mr. Olson. I don't really have much uh, to add that, that we haven't already recovered over tonight, so I wish everyone a pleasant evening. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Jenks? I'll break precedence and also wish everyone <laughs> a pleasant <laughs> evening. Wow. All my friends are all laughing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, i got to break precedence, too, and be the long-winded commissioner then, right? <laughs> <laughs> that would be a switch. <laughs> The only thing I'm going to add is that the tickets are now on sale at the rec center for the auction. It's an event that regularly sells out, so stop in there and get your tickets. Thank you. That was good. Thank that you, Mr. <laughs> and uh, that'll be all. And with that, I adjourn the meeting. Thank you very much for all participation. Thank you for staying. <laughs>